Okay, so we came up with some hypotheses, and um, and then we 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 saw the culprit, right? The culprit of what's eating my pepper plants is this guy right here, this big old gigantic caterpillar, right? And um, so we had some good hypothesis. We said there's a hailstorm. We said there a coon came by and did some damage and then somebody else brought up the fact that there's probably some insect damage, right? And and so you can see there is insect damage, right? Or at least larval, the larval state of the insect, right? So if we, we started to talk about the scientific method, right? And so the scientific method is about making observation, starting to ask questions, right? Um, we form hypothesis that we want to test. We'll make a prediction about what that hypothesis might might prove or disprove or provide evidence for, right? And then we do the experiment. And if the experiment works, we accept that the hypothesis was good and we might wanna do a little bit of um, a second round of testing to be sure, if depending on what you're doing, right? If you're working on your tractor, and it's different than if you are working on a, a new, new cancer drug or something like that, right? But uh, if the hypoth if what we say in the hypothesis doesn't work, we reject the hypothesis and we sometimes augment it, we change it, and then we retest with the with a different variable, right? So, um, and then eventually, you know, whatever we come up with, whatever data, whether that data supports or rejects our initial ideas, our hypothesis we can publish it because even in science, even bad data, when data does, when, when an experiment doesn't work, bad data informs the body of scientists who are working in that particular discipline or in that particular problem. And it allows them to not conduct the same experiments or have a different opinion about, or different idea about how that particular experiment should be run. But it, either way, it informs it, it informs the, the, the body of, uh, of scientists doing that, right? And so therefore, we're better off for understanding a little bit more, right? So um, a lot of scientists do not like to publish negative data because um, they feel like it's not good for their academic careers. But to me, if you can inform, if you can inform the institutions that are doing research so that they don't do the set, make the same mistakes. It's a good thing, right? But a lot of scientists are well, you know, we 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 lost a year and a half doing this research. We don't want to give anybody else the upper hand <laughs> on what we learned and what didn't work. So we're not going to publish, right? And so a lot of them don't don't publish for that reason and others. But those are my own, right? So scientific process is about making observations first, right? Um, What's going on? What do you see? What's the problem? What seems to be the what seems to be the um, the constraints of whatever issue you're working with, right? Then you formulate a hypothesis that might solve the problem, might fix, might provide a solution, right? Um, and then um, you can like we did, we came up with several different hypotheses. You can make a prediction about the hypothesis you're going to uh, experiment with, right? And so you can say, well, this is gonna fix the problem. This drug is gonna work because it's going to shrink tumors, you know, whatever it might be. And then you go and um, make that prediction and then you test the hypothesis. You test the prediction, you experiment um, and try to see if you can provide evidence that will uh, support your hypothesis, right? Or evidence that won't support it. And then you, you draw conclusions, right? Does it support it? Can you accept the hypothesis? Or can you accept that that might be a viable way to solve the problem? Or do you reject the hypothesis, right? Uh, and then you can go in and talk about it and with your colleagues and try to figure out what might be wrong and if the if the evidence doesn't the data doesn't support the hypothesis then you um, 
reject the hypothesis and maybe change it and then maybe try a different a different router, a different parameter, a different variable to see if you can get it so that it supports your what you're trying to do, try to solve a problem. Okay. So there I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with it. There is some um, integrity issues with some scientists. There have been some scientists that have published uh, research and it appears I don't I'm not going to say that they did but it appears that their data was inconsistent so that it looks like the data was augmented it was changed and that is a big no-no uh, you can be uh, completely um, sanctioned and not allowed to do research in the scientific community and definitely not allowed to get any grants if you are dishonest by any way when you are conducting experiments and, and publishing research, right? So we have to be careful with that. There's no way to prove anything beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you will, like the court wants, right, uh, in science, because what we do is we provide evidence that supports a hypothesis but that doesn't mean that that particular hypothesis is 100%, right? So as we as we continue on to do research, we might we might get and we might glean more information about the kinds of things we're talking about or studying, and it might add value to what we already know, and therefore we might change our initial ideas about how a process, how a life cycle, how some how some element of science works, uh, and therefore we can we can change what we understand and what we know to be theory, right? So remember, scientific theory um, is accepted as factual, but it's it's fluid. It can change because as we do more research and learn more about whatever we're doing we might change what we understand to be completely true about a process, a system, or whatever it might be that we're looking at. Okay. Um, it's just important to understand that. So that's why, um, I don't know if you guys have been watching, um, I, I'm getting kind of tired of it myself, but I still watch it because there's always things I can learn. But if you watch the way the CDC has been talking you know, 18 months ago, a year ago, six months ago, and currently, you know that they've changed their stance. They've changed their statements on some of the aspects of the coronavirus, and that's not because um, they're fudging data or uh, or have, did, we just didn't understand what was going on. And as we do more and more research, we have a better idea of what's going on. We have a better idea of what might stop um, the spread of the coronavirus. We have a better idea of how vaccines work. We have a better idea of the efficacy of vaccines. We have a better idea of how Regeneron's um, monoclonal antibodies work. We have a better idea of convalescent plasma and how it works. So there's a lot of things going on out there, right? And there are different disciplines that study every one of those aspects of the science surrounding the spread of that virus. And so as we get more and more information, we change our understanding. And we as scientists want to communicate to the public what those findings are. But then, you know, of lately, within the last year, science has been um, very ridiculed quite a bit because they don't have all the answers. It takes a long time to and science, right? It's not like you can, like this cartoon might say, right? So look, half the work is done, right? You came up with a conclusion, but there's no data to support it. You can't have a conclusion without having data, right? And so some of the early drugs that were touted as being um, supportive of uh, treating COVID-19, we found that they truly were not uh, effective, right? As a matter of fact, um, with at least uh, the hydro hydroxychloroquine and the AZT synergy, 
that we put together, um, the studies that were done in Brazil and the studies that were done in Europe, a lot of them were stopped early because they were they were hurting the patients more than they were helping them, right? So that's something that that number one science never said worked. A uh, few people did, right? But mostly politicians. But um, scientists never said that that didn't work. Um, that it worked, and so we we now have evidence that it doesn't work. The other drug is ivermectin. If you've been following that one, there is a couple of uh, of studies out there, small ones, that say that it has a modest effect, but the larger ones say there is no effect. And so you know, you have to go with what science is saying. So I'll stick with what with what I know and what I understand, right? When we do these types of experiments, there's a controlled experiment, right? So that we can affect or change a variable. And then we can test that particular variable, what we call the test subjects to a controlled uh, population, which do not get the treatment or do not get the effect of whatever we're looking at, right? And then we compare the two and we use statistics to try to figure out whether or not there is a statistical significance between those two, the experimental and the control. And then that doesn't mean that we're gonna accept it right away. That just means that that is a clue about how things might work. And so therefore um, we might um, have other studies get done, um, kind of trying to su support the same hypothesis. And so at some point you have enough data that basically people are comfortable saying, yeah, it works, right? We call these things that we measure or these things that we change, we call them variables. And so I know some of you all already know this, right? But the independent variable is the variable that's being tested. It's the variable that we want to measure, right? The dependent variable is the thing we change or the thing we observe, okay? So if we, if we think about them, uh, then we talked about, you know, um, I, I very quickly talked about uh, some plants in my garden where I was wa watering them three times a week and other group where I was watering them one time a week and then we were looking at growth, right, versus how much water they had. And then you could tell the different variables, the different tests that we were doing to see which one was better. And you can learn a lot by doing that, right? Even in your own backyard. So if we test ten, uh, cancer drugs, right? Where I, my background is in pharmaceuticals. I did a lot of testing. I did a lot of, um, of thinking about drugs. I did a lot about make, uh, did a lot of studies about making sure the efficacy of drugs were correct and, and good uh, and safe. Um, and then I did a lot of uh, testing to see if there were other substances we could use in the place of um, other of other things we're using in the drugs to make the drugs better, right? So if we think about cancer, right, the the uncontrolled growth of a mutated cell, and we're looking to see whether or not um, a cancer drug would work, right? The, the therapy would be, again, the independent variable. And then the um, what we're measuring, of course, is how what the effect that it has on, on, the, on the tumor itself, right? And so you can see that um, we're looking to see if these drugs are going to work, right? Experimental groups versus control. Okay. Any questions? Data is important. Um, you cannot make conclusions without data. And even if you have uh, data that isn't, that doesn't support it, we should report, we, we should report the data. Okay. Any questions? So significant difference, we typically look at uh, the data, the, the one that had the test, right? And the one that had uh, what we were what we were looking to to see if there was any effect on right, and if the data supports it or if the data rejects it right. So if the data rejects it, then we reject the hypothesis and say that the drug doesn't work. If the data supports it, then we accept the hypothesis. 
and we say, yeah, that, that could work. That doesn't mean that it's going to get approved. That just means that we we think it's going to work, and so there needs to be some other there needs to be some other experiments that are done around it. Okay. Questions. So I might have misspoke a little bit now that I'm thinking about it. I want to be sure that we're on the same page, right? I don't. I I think I misspoke, but if we if we look at the variables, right? So if we think about what's being changed, that's the independent variable and the stuff that we're measuring is the dependent variable. I'll be sure that we, that I make sure that I said that correctly because now that I think about it, I might have misspoke on that. So be sure that you correct that if I said that incorrectly. Okay? I have a question. Yep. On. So like, let's say like, would it be like, let's say we're in the lab, you give us like a, something to test would that be like at the start an independent variable and then we mess around with it test it and like if it changes something it would turn into a dependent variable is that well, what you're no, saying so, or well no not, not not particularly like that so the dependent variable if you think about that's what we're measuring so in this case we're measuring um the growth of cancer right or if cancer stopped right so that's the dependent variable. That's what we're looking to see if something has an effect on, right? So in the lab, um, I'm, we might be looking at proteins. Are you with me? So we might be looking at enzymes. And I might say, you know, I want you all to test the efficacy, the, the way that that particular enzyme works on, let's say, glucose, right? So does it break down glucose or does it not, right? So that would be that would be the dependent variable. The independent variable would be the different, the different pHs, right? So let's say I said do use a pH of two, use a pH of six, and use a pH of 10, and use a pH of 12, right? And so you're going to be varying those different, those different variables, right? So they're independent, and you're going to see if they have an effect on the enzyme itself. Okay, Juan, do you get does that make sense to you? So the enzyme is the enzyme, right? It's supposed to work on the substrate, the, the sugar, right? But we want to know, does the pH alter that, right? So does the pH stop it? Does the pH make it go, make it work better? Or does the pH have no effect on it, right? Okay, Juan? Yeah, I think I understand. Okay. All right. Talked about all this stuff. So significant difference is um, is done by an analysis using um, some statistical package, right? And so there are statistical packages that we're going to use in lab, right? Yeah, the first lab that we'll do next week is going to look at at the central line. It's going to look at the mean, the mode. Um, and um, and the median, right? And then we're going to draw uh, trend lines and look at best fits and and maybe do standard deviation, right? But later on, we're going to be making some predictions, and so we're going to be using regression to help us make those kinds of determinations, also. Okay. So we'll be using some some different statistical applications um, in our lab. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what this is? What do we call this type of diagram? Anybody know? Compare and contrast. It's a Venn diagram, right? A Venn diagram. That's what it. That's that's what it does. It's a Venn diagram, but that's what it does. That's correct. So the Venn diagram, you can see. I think I told you that theory and science is a little bit different. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, theory and science is a little bit different than the th than theory that's used by um, by people, everyday people who are late late people, right? So remember, we, the, the middle is the data. It's whether or not the data is supporting the predictions and the hypotheses we made. And over a period of time, if that data helps to support with the hypothesis, helps to support why something occurs and how it occurs, right? If we have a mountain of evidence, a bunch of evidence that basically says this is the way it is, right? So for, for instance, we believe 
that uh, DNA is in double helix, right? And that adenine always binds to thymine and guanine always binds to cytine, cytosine, and they're held together by hydrogen attractions, right? Um, we believe that. And so there's a mountain of evidence that shows that, but does that mean that we understand it completely? Mm, not really, right? There might be some changes that happen because as we get to know that particular aspect of science, as we do more and more research, some of that might change. And it has changed from the time that Watson and Creek first, uh, first talked about how it worked, right? There's a lot of changes that have happened to that. But so it's a theory and theory is accepted, if you will, accepted fact in science. That doesn't mean that that is 100%. That just means that that's the way we understand it right now. That's the way we believe it works right now. That doesn't mean it's not going to change. That just means that, that ex it's explained that way now. And eventually, you know, if, there, it, if, it, if it never changes, uh, if it's gone like that for years and years and years, right, 100 plus, then it may become a law. Right, and so the law of gravity, right? So, you know, uh, those things are set in stone. They are the law, the law of thermodynamics, right? So you heard of some of these laws, right? And so these are things that we know to be fact for a long period of time. There's a mountain of evidence supports it and it's never changed. So therefore it becomes scientific law, but it takes a long time, right? Science moves very slow, right? So I think um, you guys may have seen that, oh my goodness, we got a vaccine done in about nine months, right? So that is astronomically fast. And people were a little bit hesitant or a little bit afraid about taking the vaccine. Uh, I made vaccines um, in one of my pharmaceutical companies that I worked for. So I know how they work and I was, I was completely comfortable with them, but uh, some of my family members were not. Right, so it's just understanding at different levels. And if we could make sure that we, this is, a, this is a good thing to know. As a scientist, if you, you'll be able to talk the language, you'll be able to talk science to other scientists, but you really become very unique, very sought out uh, or sought after and very, very um, important to the group of individuals you work with and work for, if you can communicate science to people who don't have a science background. So you should always be thinking about how you might be able to do that, right? It's okay to think science, right? I think it all the time, but it's more important that you're able to discuss it and explain it to people who don't understand science because then you're going to um, you're going to be much more successful. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right. So, if we looked at different types of reasoning, right? There is inductive and deductive reasoning. So you can see that inductive reasoning really is looking at observation and then coming down with the with the conclusion, right? Um, where deductive reason is you have a general premise, right? Uh, because you see specific results that uh, have predicted that or, 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 or show you how that might be, right? So inductive and deductive reasoning, we use them all the time, right? Um, um, it's, it's important to understand how these things are, are used and, and how they're used. But a lot of times we don't talk about, well, that's a deductive argument or that's an inductive argument, right? We just simply, we just simply look at the data and then we make observations and then we make a conclusion or we have a general, we have a general premise and then we look for that predicted result, okay? That's for later. Applied science is a different, right? So applied science is learning from experience, right? It's, uh, it's what we can do to help right now without doing experiments, what can we try to help individuals, right? So 
or animals, right? So after after hurricanes, you know, a bunch of wildlife is displaced. There are a lot of times disoriented, but because we've had so so much experience with um, with um, hurricanes, we know how to handle animals that are hurt or animals that are misplaced, right? We can put them back in the environment that they're going to thrive in because, you know, a pelican's not going to do well in, um, in Missouri, right? Uh, but a pelican will do really well on anywhere where there is marine life, right? And so we just need to know that. One of the really most interesting things ever was um, there were some applied scientists who um, were using um, bacteria to clean up oil spills, right? And so they found out that they that they, if they collected some of the oil, that they could grow bacteria that like the oil. And what they did was they proved that they could uh, completely break down oil, oil spills to glycerol and some fatty acids, all of which could be used by the environment, right? And so they grew these organisms up and anytime there was an oil spill, people could hire them and they'd go out there and they could clean up the oil spill for them, right? Um, the other thing that was important for me when when we started when I started to get interested, I know there's at least two people in here who are into into conservation like I am. The other thing that uh, was important to me is that um, some applied scientists, when the oil got onto the feathers of of birds or uh, or the fur of um, sea otters or other things, other animals that are in the ocean. What they found out is, you know, I think you may have learned this already, but like dissolves like. And so if these things were hydrocarbon by nature, right, that they could use something that was similar to it to remove it, right? Now you don't want to use gasoline. Gasoline would work, but gasoline is really dangerous to use. But they thought, well, why don't we use a surfactant, right? What is a surfactant? Can somebody tell me what a surfactant is? What is a surfactant? Stephen, what do you think? What's a surfactant? I'm really not sure. <laughs> okay. Breaks the water tension, Sunny. Thank you very much. Okay. So Great. really what, what Sunny is saying is that it's a soap. Are you with me? So what the applied scientists did was they bought a whole bunch of Dawn soap and they started to rub that on the feathers of birds and they started to um, put that on the surface of manatees and what it did is it removed all the oil because it's a like substance, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's where that came from, Tamara, T uh, Tamara. Yeah, that's where that came from. But if you grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, like I did, um, we use a different type of surfactant. We use baby oil, right? So again, baby oil is kind of like oil, right? Uh, Hydrocarbon, you know, like oil that's used for fuel. And so anytime we would get tar on our, on our bodies or on our feet, we would use baby oil and it would come right off, right? So the, one of the applied scientists who came up with the idea was hired by Don and and um, Don paid them a lot of money to come and work for them because they had done such good work and they had proven that their product could save a whole bunch of wildlife right um, and so uh, but I uh, watched uh, I watched uh, uh, a show that had the scientists on there and they said that they got the idea from working um, with their father uh, as a mechanic, as a very young individual, and when they um, when they had oil and grease all over their hands, the way they took it off was they use a, a surfactant, right, uh, to remove it. And so he said, if we could find something that wasn't very that wasn't very dangerous, he said we we tried uh, baby shampoo also, and it worked just great. But he said that the uh, the the amount of surfactant that was in baby soap was less. And so they went to Dawn and Dawn worked best. And so I just think that's a pretty cool story uh, to think about, you know, how people used observations, um, made 
to put hypotheses together and were able to and able to apply that right then and there without doing a lot of experimentation, right? Like dissolves like, we know that. And so therefore let's use a surfactant to remove that oil from animals. And so it was really good, okay? We're constantly updating our, um, our body of knowledge, right? So even with the human genome project, right? We once uh, once the entire genome was mapped out, we now know where different diseases lie on that on our genetic chromosomes, and so individuals now are using CRISPR to edit those pieces of DNA that um, that that are responsible for the um, the phenotype that the the disease itself, and so. Um, They've already cured two people from sickle cell disease, which I think is just marvelous, right? So uh, you can look that up and read about it. But uh, CRISPR technology uh, is going to have a really big impact on our lives, not right now, but in the future, it, in my lifetime. And I've got maybe, I don't know, got maybe 30 good years left. So um, in my lifetime, we're going to be using CRISPR technology to to cure people of diseases, not treat them. That's different, right? So for a diabetic individual, you treat them by allowing them to take insulin in some manner, either oral or injection, right? But to cure them, you would have to make their pancreas work again. And this is a, a real possibility for the future. And I'm pretty excited about that. I'm not going to be working on it, right? But maybe some of you all will, and then you can send me an email and tell me how y'all are doing. I just think it's great, all right? What defines life, all right? So these are the things that define life. They have organization, right? Their cells are organized. They're homeostatic. What does that mean when we say they're homeostatic? What does that mean? What do you think? Alberto, what do you think? What does homeostatic mean? Tamara, what does homeostatic mean? It's based off on homeostasis. Okay, so what's homeostasis? That's okay. What is homeostasis? Balance. I like that a lot. Yeah. So from the time you were born to the time you die, Every cell in your body, mm -hmm, yeah, every cell in your body is fighting to maintain homeostasis, right? To maintain a balance, right? And so if you think about that, there's a lot of different, a lot of different um, cellular processes that are in our cells that are fighting to stay in homeostasis. The amount of salt that's in a, the amount of salt that is in a cell the amount of uh, water that's in a cell, right? Uh, the turgicity of a cell, right? How warm your body is, right? That's right. Um, how much sugar is released into your body, in your bloodstream, so that all of your cells can obtain nourishment. All those things are homeostatic. All those things are there, plus a whole bunch of others, right? And so life is homeostatic. Metabolism, right? So metabolism is not just you eat correctly to be fit. Metabolism is much more than that. It's a series of chemical reactions that break down large molecules and, and in doing so, it generates energy, ATP. And then that's called a catabolic reaction. An anabolic reaction takes those smaller molecules and puts them back together in a way that our cells can utilize them, right? And in the process of doing that, that pro those processes that we call anabolic use ATP, right? Homeostatic, right? Our interaction and our responsiveness, right? Uh, how we react to stimuli, right? And that's not just, oh, there's a really beautiful person over there. I just can't take my eyes off of them. It is also uh, you touch a you touch the barbecue grill and you didn't know it was 
hot and you burned yourself, right? And you pull back really quickly. That's that responsiveness and that interaction, right? Reproduction, all, all things that are alive reproduce, right? Some things reproduce sexually and asexually, and some things just reproduce asexually, right? So we, as humans, as animals, reproduce asexually a lot, right? And that means that every single cell in our body reproduces and becomes two, right? So every single um, skin cell or tongue cell or uh, heart cell or whatever, they reproduce and make clones of themselves, right? That's where cancer becomes a problem because once cancer is in some of those tissues and it's a mutated cell, then that particular cell starts to grow and it looks like just like our other cells, right? So it has free reign to grow, right? So that's asexual. What's the process of asexual cellular re uh, reproduction in us as humans? What is that called? Does anybody know? Mitosis, thank you, Campbell. That's correct, mitosis. We also reproduce sexually, but in order to do so, we have to be able to have a sperm and an ova, right? And um, therefore, there has to be an interaction between uh, a male and a female. Um, and I know there's a lot of different uh, genders and things like that. I'm just talking science here. So there has to be an interaction between individuals who are born male and are born female um, and um, in order to conceive um, a fertilized, a fertilized ova, right? But that is sexual reproduction. Somebody tell me what the process of, of um, the production of, of sex cells, of gametes, what is that process called in humans? Meiosis, very good. So you can see what is the, what are the, what are the benefits of meiosis over mitosis? Can anybody tell me? more genetic diversity. That's correct. Any, any uh, individual or any uh, animal or any plant or any fungus, all these things reproduce sexually. Um, when they produce a progeny, when they produce offspring, that offspring is unique to the world and probably will never ever be reproduced ever again because the statistics are so great that you would have that kind of of um, crossing over and alignment and fertilization to happen exactly correct would not happen again. So Miss, um, uh, let's see, Campbell, Campbell, you're unique. You are the only Campbell. Are you with me? Uh, now, there might be other people named Campbell, but you're the only Campbell that is you. You know, I always kind of like to think about Winnie the Pooh and Tigger, and Tigger says, I'm the only one. Well, <laughs> you, each of you are the only one. There can never be another one like you. Are you with me? So, you know, some people, um, even if you're identical twins, that's correct. Yeah. So you're... Even though you're identical twins, you're going to be a little bit different. Now, now genetically, Alberto, you're going to be the same. But we are all we are all based. We we all have we are all individuals, not only on our genetic traits and our and our DNA, but also in the experiences that we have in life. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. And it's more than just personality. It might just be likes and dislikes also, right? Yeah. So it's, an, it's really cool. Heredity, right? So heredity, DNA, we're all going to be able to share our traits with our offspring, right? And that's an important thing. Well, you know, you might think, well, if you're a bacteria, you share your traits with offspring also, and that is true, but the difference is, like Campbell said, is that if you are the product of, of sexual union, you are genetically unique, right? 
and then growth and development, right? All life is going to, if you will, um, grow and going to develop and then eventually going to, uh, the cells are going to divide, right? And so that's just part of life. And that happens with every single organism on the planet that is alive, right? Things that are on the planet that affect us, that are not alive, are things like viruses and prions, right? And we've talked a little bit about those already. But those things have different replication processes, but they do not meet the requirements of life. I always tell my students in other courses that if they cannot get past um, metabolism and reproduction, then I don't even look at them, right? <laughs> so viruses can reproduce, check, but they don't metabolize, so they're not alive, right? Pro, uh, prions can reproduce, check, but they don't metabolize, they're not alive, okay? And there's a lot of other things also, but, uh, but if you think about those for just a minute, that, that makes it kind of easy, right? So here are all these things, all these properties of life that define life, and so if you look at anything that you are studying and you want to figure out whether or not it's living or non-living, right, then, then you can think about these things. Again, I just simply go to you know, reproduction and metabolism. And if they don't do one of those two things, I don't look any further because those are just really easy, right? They're the first two that you think about. Organization, so if you think about this toad, right, and the way it's organized, the cells are different. Right, and so that's because every single part of this animal, right, um, certain genes are turned on and all the others are turned off, right? So the integument of it, so explain to what you mean by that, Alberto. Tell me what you, what do you mean by that? Like, like, can you give me an example? Not that I am aware of, right? I, I, I think it's one of the. My bad. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I I had a different thing. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So they can they can have they can have a few of these characteristics, but they gotta have them all to be alive. Are you with me? Okay, Stephen, what, did, what was your comment? I was going to ask about viruses. I know they're not alive, but I can't remember which one of the requirements they don't meet. They do not, um, they do not metabolize at all. Okay. The other, the other thing that's interesting about viruses is they don't have DNA or RNA. So they really don't, they don't really develop. Are you with me? So um they're, they're either dna virus or an rna virus so they don't really have any development they mutate like crazy but that's different a non-living entity is what they if a virus finds a host they can they can reproduce that's correct that is correct hung hand okay mm -hmm. anybody else steven did i answer your question Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. So if you think about you, right, why, why uh, are tongue cells not growing? Why are tongue cells not growing on your foot? Or why are tongue cells not growing in your liver? That is correct, right? So they take over the, they take over the machi machinery of the cell, Jessica, and they redirect that machinery so that they, the cell now basically uses everything it has to produce more viruses. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So the, the question is, why are, why is your tongue cells only on your tongue and not anywhere else? What do you think? 
Malaya, what do you think? Um, because the, um, I'm not entirely too sure. That's okay, that's okay. Because as Campbell said, most of the genes and these cells are turned off. So the ones that are turned on make them specific to what their function needs to be, right? And so these cells, as they reproduce, they're going to produce more clones of each other, and the same genes are going to be turned on, and everything else will be turned uh, on. What is that supposed to mean? Like the genes are turned on and off, like. Okay, that's a good. That's a good. So there, we're going to learn about this, Juan. So. Um, it's like, it's like a light switch. That's exactly right. No, well, I mean, so an easy way to know that, yeah, is that there are these uh, regulatory, there are these switches, if you will, that are in the cells. And so they will allow for certain genes to be expressed and other genes to not be expressed, to be dormant. Okay, Juan? Okay. So Juan, if I... Juan, if, if I was a weird guy and uh, I really liked you a lot uh, and I wanted my own Juan, are you with me? I could follow you around and when you drank your coffee, I could go and get your coffee cup after you threw it away. I could collect some cells from your coffee cup because we, we, uh, we leave cells behind everywhere we go. I could take some of those cells off of your coffee, coffee cup and let's say I'm, I, I'm a I'm a scientist that can do these things at my house. I could then extract the DNA from your cells that were on your coffee cup and I could make my own one. Are you with me? I could make a clone of you. Yeah. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. So there are other countries. I'm not going to mention any specifically. Um, yeah, we can do that now. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that now. And so there's a lot of debate right now going on with scientists. In the United States, we do not clone. We do not clone people. Uh, we did sheep. We did monkeys. We did other uh, animals. But there was a there's a country you can look it up. I'm not gonna say, but there was a country that cloned individuals. <laughs> well, yeah. So I mean. Um, you know, with CRISPR technology and with um, um, with the specimens of mosquitoes and other insects that have been kind of um, in um, in amber, there are people in this in this country uh, who would like to bring back the dinosaurs. <laughs> That's a true thing. People are, are talking about it. Uh, they don't belong here anymore, right? They had their time 65 million years ago. Yeah, the, we, we don't want to do that, right? I would rather bring back, I would rather try to save the cheetahs and the tigers and things like that. Yeah, well, yeah, you'd be lunch also, right? So, uh, but uh, yeah, oh God, a baby T-Rex, my God. All right, let's go on. So life is able to adapt, right? And so um, when life adapts, they can survive. And a lot of times it's mutations that occur. And when they occur, um, they occur randomly. Uh, about every one billionth cell division, there is a mutation that occurs. A lot of times our mechanisms in our body will correct those mutations, right? And, um, and we don't have a problem with it. And so if the mutations don't get corrected, then there's a problem, right? A lot of times with us, it is uh, it is cancer, right? So it can be really, really bad. But it, can you see the organism in this particular field of view? Right, it's a seahorse, right? So you might be able to see it. It has adapted very well. Um, yeah, so... You can see the seahorse here. It is adapted very well to look like the environment that it lives in, and therefore it's protected from being eaten. Natural selection, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. 
uh, homeostasis, right? So polar bears, there's a reason they're um, they're white, right? So they blend in with the environment that they're in. Um, so it's a it it is it is an amazing thing that we have these beautiful animals still on this planet, right? But um, the, so uh, okay, the way that happens. Well, uh, are you talking about the seahorse or the bear? I guess it doesn't make a difference either one. So the way that happens is it happens at random. It's a mutation. And the mutation allows for the organism to have a better chance of surviving in the environment. Then those particular genes are passed on to progeny. So eventually it becomes the dominant trait, right? So the pygmy seahorses all kind of can blend into the environment because they have those genes that allow allow them to do that. And that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's a jackrabbit, right? And you can see that their ears are fairly large and they use those fairly large, large ears because the blood um, is in vessels that are closer to the integument, closer to the skin. And so they can get their blood warmed up by the sun and uh, it can keep them uh, warm when they are in colder environments, right? And so that's an adaptation that that they have to regulate their temperature, okay? Homeostasis for us, there's a lot of different, pro I talked about some of them, sugar regulation, temperature regulation. Um, there's a bunch of different aspects of um, homeostasis that are in our body. We're very complex organisms. Um, and so we have a lot of these different things that are working in our body. But that means also is there's a lot more things that can go wrong with us, right, unfortunately, okay? Energy processing, so the take up of energy, the, the, take, the taking up of nutrients, the producing of energy and the ex expenditure of energy, right? So you can see here's a California condor um, still on the endangered uh, li list, but we've done really well about protecting them. People were shooting these birds. These, they're they're kind of not pretty, but they're pretty cool if you think about them. They're scavengers, and people were shooting them just because they were ugly, right? And so we've lost many a species, uh, and still we have the potential to lose a lot of species because of that. The grizzly bear was on the endangered list. We took it off, and now it's threatened again because people are killing them. The bears are killing livestock, the blue owl. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of them. The vaquita, there's a lot of them. Um, so the bears are hungry and they eat livestock and ranchers shoot them, right? Because they're not on the endangered list anymore. So now we're, we're, having, we're having problems with that. And then that, that doesn't, um, that, I mean, you you might see the rancher is protecting their you know their investment but there are individuals um who are just killing animals for just a little portion of them right um uh yeah the, the black rhinos and white rhinos yeah just uh, just recently i don't remember which one one of them went, went extinct right but what's going on right now in the waters of, uh, of the oceans is people are overfishing them and they are really just destroying the ecology. There are certain groups of individuals who um, like to consume um, shark, fin, shark fins. And so there are people out there who are catching sharks, all different kinds of sharks cutting their fins off and throwing them back in the ocean where they die, right? And so we're losing lots of sharks, right? And yeah, and so we're trying to wrap our mind around how we can do this because um, the Gulf of Mexico, part of the Atlantic Ocean and part of the Pacific Ocean uh, where our country um, comes in contact with are the only places where shark species are not endangered. A lot of other places, sharks are endangered because they're being overfished. And that that goes for all marine life, right? Um, so look it up and you can read about it, right? 
sensitivity response to stimuli, right? So here, of course, is a carnivorous plant, right? That doesn't mean the plant isn't photosynthetic because all plants are photosynthetic, right? But they need certain um, amino acids that they cannot get from the environment. So they have to consume insects in order to get those uh, amino acids, okay? DNA and reproduction. So here's a mama cat with a bunch of other cats that are a bunch of different uh, colors and patterns. And, and that's all because of the different things that happen in meiosis. Right? So every one of those progeny are um, the uh, product of a union of a sperm and a different ova. And so you can see that uh, there can be lots of variation in one litter, litter of cats depending on what the, what the other uh, organism that is involved in that union is like, right? Growth and development, right? Um, we are related to re um, reptiles because uh, we produce sperm and egg like they do, right? Now they're more closely related to chickens, of course, because chickens lay eggs like the reptiles do but we are related to them also. And I'll show you that phylogenetic tree in just a little bit. So there's a hierarchy of life, right? We put them in order, right? We, we as humans are trying to understand our environment and try to understand our world. And in order to do that, we um, put things together so that they make sense to us, right? So we put things in groups. And so, those, those groups of organisms are the general kind of themes for what we see in the environment, for what kinds of things come together. And when these things come together, they make other things, right? And so if we think about how these general themes come together, you can see that the general themes of life are that atoms come together and make molecules, molecules come together and make organelles and cells the cells come together and form tissues and tissues do a specific function for the organism. Tissues come together and make organs, right? Organs come together and make organisms or organ systems. And then the organ systems come together and make organisms. And a whole bunch of organisms come together and make a population. So there's a population of moose, right? They come together with other animals and they make e ecosystems and ecosystems are important because they're in balance. Everything in nature is in balance, right? Nature is in balance. We are the only species on this planet that puts nature out of balance. We're the only ones, but we do so much damage to this planet um, because of what we're trying to do to make our lives better. But in making our lives better, we're destroying the ecosystem. And we'll destroy, destroy the ecosystem uh, because that's a bunch of organisms coming together and living together in balance. Then we destroy life, right, on the planet. And so I talked a little bit about, um, you know, what happens when uh, things don't go right. Um, we start to have, we start to lose organisms off the planet. And I read a paper about four years ago that stated that 40% uh, of all the birds are gone, right? So that's the birds that were here on the planet, right? And so there's a lot of pressure on these ecosystems and the organisms that are most uh, vulnerable because they, their adaptations are less, co less complicated, right? Frogs, salamanders, those kinds of things they're the ones that are going to be affected the most. When's the last time you saw a frog? How many people live in Austin, Texas? How many people live in Austin? Okay. You saw a frog yesterday, Alberto? It wasn't a toad, it was a frog. It was a frog though. Okay. Uh, yeah, toads are different, right? Toads can survive a little, okay, I, I believe you. Well, so I had not seen a frog, and I have a I have a wet creek in my on my property. It goes right through my property, and I had not seen a frog for three years. I finally saw a frog this year, but that's because we have had so much rain this spring, right? Yeah. So the difference between a frog and a toad, 
um, <laughs> roughness of the skin that, and other things, but that's the easy one, right? So, so the frogs are very smooth integument, a very smooth skin, right? And therefore things can go right through their skin, right? They can get a sunburn, uh, all kinds of things, right? They, they're more, le they're more likely to, uh, uh, become dehydrated and die. Are you with me? Toads are very thick skinned. Um, they're protected. They maintain moisture. And so I see toads all the time, right? But frogs are different. I don't, I don't see, I saw one, but mostly because my wife pointed it out because I wouldn't have seen it, but it was in a, it was in a, one of our pots that we're growing some of our uh, plants in. And uh, she said, come look at this frog. It was a leopard frog. I mean, so it wasn't, it, you know, 15 years ago, a leopard frog would not be anything I would have been excited about, but um, I was really excited about seeing this frog. I gave it some crickets that I caught so that it could eat because I wanted it to survive, right? Because uh, it, it, it was lonely. I don't, know, I don't know where all its friends were, but it was lonely. So it's an important thing to think about, right? So you can see how these different things are all put together, these general themes, right? We are going to be looking at these things right here in this course, right? We're going to be looking at molecules, atoms, organelles, and cells. Everything else, if you go on to become a scientist and you take the second semester of biology, then you all will be studying these things, all of these things, right? And that's structure and functions of cells, that's biology 1407 but we're going to be concentrated here. Okay, good. So land, water, and the atmosphere make up the biosphere, right? There's lots of different ecosystems um, in the biosphere, right? Some organisms like terrestrial parts, some people, some of the organisms like um, the aquatic parts, uh, and some of them uh, have to come in contact with light. Some of them are found on the on the floors of the forest because they don't need light, but they can live off of all the decaying vegetation. And so there's lots of really cool um, synergies that are going on, right? So all of this is in balance, forms a community, not only animals, but plants, right? So all of these organisms are balanced. Um, the deer eats a plant, the deer poos in the woods, and the plants use the poo as nutrients to enrich themselves so that they can continue to grow. There's a constant balance of these things. The populations of species in the forests and in the jungles and in your backyard, they're everywhere, right? Um, so one of the reasons that I brought up the idea that we, I would like to do that uh, moth project with you all is because um, Moths are a sentinel uh, group of organisms. If there's a lot of pollution, there will not be a lot of moths. So we'll be able to tell how healthy the different parts of, uh, of Austin, Texas are based on where we get our population and, and of moths and what, and what we see, right? So individual organisms make up populations, right? And then you have uh, organs and organ uh, systems, right? And so if you think about them, you know, the leaves or organs, just like our heart is, and they go into making organ systems, but it's all about structure and function and how these tissues come together. So whether there are um, nerves that control muscles or bones that support our body or the bones that are very light, so it allows the animals to take flight or mitochondria that allow for ATP to be generated and used and then regenerated, right? All of those things are order that our particular um, bodies are in with, with tissues also you can see. The tissues do a specific function and then leaves of course are organs and they do specific things. Talk about cells and how cells are made up. We're gonna be talking about cells a lot this semester, right? But there's different parts of cells that are really important for them, right? And so you can see in the in this particular 
um, portion here, you can see the chloroplast inside of the leaf cells and the chloroplasts allow for photosynthesis. And remember when people tell you photosynthesis is the way that plants make their energy, that is not correct. Photosynthesis is the way that plants make their nutrients. They still have to undergo cellular respiration to make ATP, okay? Good. And then of course, atoms form molecules, molecules form organelles, and you have this general theme going on, on er in everything we do. And then with heredity, we know that it's all about the master molecule DNA, right? And there's so much about DNA we still don't know, right? Um, 20 years ago when I was in um, college, it's longer than that, but um, we would call the non the non coding regions of the DNA, we would call them junk DNA. But now we know that there's a lot of regulatory things that go on in that DNA and that non-regulatory part and that non-coding part. Uh, and also we know that we can use that, those non-coding regions in DNA as a forensic tool because people who are related to each other, their uh, DNA and their non-coding regions is gonna be very similar. Right, so we can use that to, you can't run away from science anymore, right? So my wife is a forensic scientist. She's retired. She retired when she was 48 uh, and decided she wanted to be a garden and help people. And she does a lot of things uh, as a volunteer to help other people. Um, but uh, she, you could give her some hair or some tissue or a little bit of blood from an animal, right? Let's say there was somebody who we found a bunch of tissue on their truck. They could take a little bit of that, sent a little bit of that tissue, blood or hair or whatever, send it to my wife and she could tell you what animal it is, how old it was, what the gender was, and she could tell you all those things. So you cannot hide from science anymore, right? Even DNA is so stable that even the DNA that was, um, that is 40 or 50 years old and people were put away for murder, right? Um, we could take that evidence and we could run it now and we could tell whether or not that evidence would support or would completely um, show that that individual was not involved with that particular murder, right? And so these are really powerful tools that we can use and nobody and nobody can run away from science anymore, right? There are, there, are, there are people who get away with crimes, but that's because they're really good about not leaving their DNA behind. I would be a really bad criminal because uh, I would leave my DNA everywhere. I just, I just it's just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't register with me that, uh, that your DNA is being kind of given off all the time. So yeah, you could do that, but that would hurt. So, you know, I, I don't really want to do that. But even if you did that and you cut yourself, Alberto, and left a little bit of your blood, we could still find you, right? Yeah. So we're going to be talking a lot about DNA. The whole, the whole uh, last two units of the course are about DNA. Um, so yeah, that is pretty hardcore, right? But we're, we're not going to be talking about biodiversity unless it's related to DNA and how DNA can add to that biodiversity, because I will have a little bit of talk about cancer and about the cheetahs and the tigers that are in trouble, right? And whether or not um, you all would agree or disagree. I know certain people, Alberta, want to bring back the dinosaur, but um, I, want to, I want to save the animals that are here and that are in danger of becoming extinct. Right? That's what I want to do. Right, so if we think about the different organisms that are on the planet belong to one of these groups, right? They are either an archaea, ancient bacteria. They are U bacteria, which is now just bacteria, right? They don't have any U anymore, so it's now just bacteria. And these are the ones you've heard of, E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus and Lycobacterium tuberculosis, those kind of things. They can be protista. They can be plantae, animalia, or fungi, right? And so you can see 
this particular tree is showing a common ancestor right here, right? And then you're seeing how different organisms branch, right? This organism or these organisms are prokaryotic. These are prokaryotic. And all of these organisms are eukaryotic. So tell me the difference again between a prokaryote and a eukaryote. What's the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote? Somebody remind me. Eukaryote have membrane-bonded organelles. That's that's really good, Campbell. What about the nucleus, right? They have a nucleus. They, they have they, they have a nucleus, right? And prokaryotic organisms do not have a nucleus. Yo means okay. no. Pro means no. Or pro means no. Pro means prior. Pro mean pro means prior to before a nucleus. Okay, that's what it means. Okay. Taxonomy is a branch that looks to name organisms, right? Again, we're trying to put things in order so that we can understand them, right? And then we have a different hierarchy of how we put things in order, right? So we have domains and kingdoms. So if you follow this, right, you can see here, we have domains, kingdoms, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and a species, right? So when I was in college, domains were not talked about, right? So even in the in the 30 years that I have been um, a professional, the, um, domains have come into play, right? So I learned about hierarchy and taxonomy in about the eighth grade. And we learned a mnemonic. Some of you may have learned this. Kings play chess on fine grain sand, right? So kings, K for kingdom, play, P for phylum, uh, chess, C for class, um, on, O for order, fine, for F for family, G, for grain for genus, and sand, S for species, right? That's the way I learned it. So here, if you look at these, you can see that the domains are now the top of the hierarchy, right? They used to be called super kingdoms and now they become domains. It's just going into that whole idea of uh, theories and science, right? Where we used to think kingdoms were the top of the hierarchy and then we learned a lot more and we added domains, right? And so these things have been around for now 20 years. Domains um, have been talked about in academia for over 20 years, right? But in the time I was in college, it wasn't. But so you can see, right, that um, if we have the domains eukarya, that's going to include bears and pandas and dogs and horses and fish and birds and plants and fungi, right, and protozoans, right? But if we go to the next one, kingdom, well, it's just the animals, right? Things that belong to animalia. If we go to the next one, phyla chordata, Chordata means they have a backbone. And so now you've taken out all the animals that don't have backbones, right? Mam um, mammalia is the class, and these are organisms that are mammals, right? And then if you break that down even more, you put it into the order carnivora, and these are animals that like to eat flesh, animal, other animals, right? And then you put them into a family, Euricidae, and now these are all the bears that are found throughout the world. And now you put it into a more um, a, a, a more general group, right? Eurysis, these are the bears. And then species, Eurysis americanus, this is the American black bear. So this is the way we as scientists put organisms um, into a hierarchy of groups so that we can study them, okay? For the scope of this course, you're going to need to know kingdoms and domains and you're going to need to be able to identify a genus and a species. All the stuff that's in between them, right? Phylum, class, order, and family, you will study in 1407, but not in this course, okay? So here's a phylogenetic tree. This is the organism that first showed up on the planet millions of years ago. And then you had branching here. You had organisms go this way, and you had organisms go this way. So here is the eukarya. That's the group we are in. 
right, along with a bunch of other organisms. So what is our closest, which, what is our closest, do, what, is, what domain is closest to us? Which, what domain are we more related to? Are we more related to bacteria or to the archaea? What do you think? Bacteria? No, we're closer to the archaea, right? Oh, so okay. the distance of this phylogenetic tree shows that we're closer to the archaea. So we share traits, more traits with the archaea than we do with the bacteria. Isn't that interesting? So we share traits with these ancient bacteria that live in these really weird places, right? They, they live uh, in hot springs and in high salt concentration environments and high alkalinity environments and really hot temperatures. We're related to them, right? More related to them than we are the bacteria. That's why we can use an antibiotic to kill bacteria because we're not related to them at all. And we ourselves are so different in structure that we can use an antibiotic to kill bacteria and it doesn't really affect us. Isn't that cool? Answer this question for me, Mr. Steven. Can we use antibiotics on viruses? No. Why is that? Uh, I don't know specifically. Well, the, the, answer, the answer is correct. No is the answer, right? Yeah. Anybody, does anybody have an insight onto why we cannot kill or get rid of viruses using antibiotics? Anybody know? Because antibiotics are made for bacteria and bacteria and viruses aren't, are two completely different things, so. Logan, I would hug you if you were here right now. That is outstanding work, outstanding, <laughs> perfect, right? Antibiotics are only good against bacteria. They're not going to work against any other organism. There are a few that can be used on protozoans, right? Um, but usually with protozoans, you need to use an antiprotozoal drug, right? And for a fungus, you need to use an antifungal drug. And for viruses, we don't have very many of them, but we have to use an antiviral drug, okay? Yeah, so I think it's pretty cool. And that all stems from, we're so different, right? This is the most current phylogenetic tree. It was published about eight years ago. It is the work of thousands of scientists. But let me just blow your mind out. This is recent, right? Yeah, this is recent. So this group right here, are the bacteria. Yes? This group right here, are the archaea. And this little tiny group that is way down in the phylogenetic tree are the eukarya. So, so Campbell, what does that say about the diversity of life on this planet? What does that say? Anybody can answer, Campbell might be shy. What does that say about the diversity of life on this planet? What does this phylogenetic tree tell us? Remember, phylogenetic or, or phylogeny is the study of the history of evolution and how organisms that are on this planet right now are related to each other, right? Most Everything is connected. Yes. What, Logan, go ahead. Uh, that you carry, that you carry out a mammals and animals are not are only a small portion of the life that yeah. is on earth that is correct logan yeah two hugs for you my goodness so right here you see this little thing right here that says opon i think you might have it let me look i don't want to i don't want to give it up if it's not there let me check real quick hold on a minute give me a second No, I don't have it. Okay, so this little, I don't know if you can read this word right here. It, it says opanstakanta. That is where we as animals are, right? 
So that one little speck right there is humans. Isn't that interesting? We are insignificant in the diversity on this planet, yet we are the organisms that do most of the damage. Okay? That's what that tree is saying. Okay? Pretty cool. Now look at this tree. Remember this tree and compare it to kind of one of the first trees that ever showed up, right? Uh, it's similar, but we know so much more. So again, phylogenetically, our understanding is forever changing. And so we are updating our understanding. Therefore, our ideas about how things are related to each other are changing. We are still more closely related because we share a common ancestor with the archaea, right? And we do share a common ancestor with bacteria, but it's pretty far away. That's millions and millions and millions of years ago. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and finish this. I have a few slides left and then we'll, we'll take a break. Right. So domain domains represent, right. The bacteria, the archaea and the eukarya. Right. And so underneath the domains, um, for the eukarya, there are, um, four different kingdoms, the plantae, the fungi, and the animalia. I now put a little bit of an asterisk by the fourth kingdom, which is the protista. These are the single-celled organisms. And the reason I do that is because there's a lot of debate about them right now. And so we, there are, there are people who are basically saying that we should have 32 different kingdoms for just for just a protista, right? Because they're so diverse. So again, you know, I told you that when I was in college, they didn't talk about domains, right? So now we're at this point in our scientific understanding where there's some scientists that say there's a lot more kingdoms in, under protista than just protista. So that's why I've separated it out, right? I could have made it easy and just put protista here, but I wanted you to know that I understand that lots of people, lots of scientists are doing a lot of studies right now and Protista is in flux along with everything else, but Protista is really in flux, okay? So the binomial nomenclature system, it means binomial two names, nomenclature, the way we name things, right? So there's a genus and a species, right? And the rule is, the first name is the genus, it's always capitalized. The second name is the species, it's always lowercase. If it's handwritten, it is underlined. And if it's typed in with a word processor, then it is, um, it is italicized. Okay, this is my dog, Bandy. She died in November from cancer. She was one of, she was the best dog I ever had. And I don't know if you see this big scar right here. That was when she developed necrotizing fasciitis, flesh eating disease. And my wife and I took care of her for over six months so that it would heal. And she survived that. And she lived another eight and a half years. Um, but mostly because um, she had two people who really loved her to death and we took care of her, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Mine died of well, we think it started in the in the reproductive area and then moved up from there, right? Uh but yeah, she was a great blessing for us. Okay. So there is unity in the diversity of life because we all share genes with everything on this plant that's alive, right? And so here what I'm showing you is the cilia of the windpipe of a human and the cilia that help paramecium of a single-celled organism move, right? And if we look at those structures, they're very similar, right? Structurally, they're very similar. And if we do DNA analysis, they are similar. So we share genes and structures. We, a very complicated multicellular organism, share structures and genes with a single celled organism. And that's pretty cool. Okay. Any questions? 
So we're looking at dinosaur fossils to see what our past tells us. And there's a lot there. And we are just beginning to understand lots of different things. This is a very complicated life cycle of malaria, right? I like to talk about this when I teach microbiology to my microbiology group. We won't do so much here, but we will talk about sickle cell and the adaptation that sickle cell has so that people don't get malaria, okay? Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, folks? We are done with the lecture. So it is three o'clock. Why don't we say we take 15 minutes, take a break and come back under lab and we will talk about the lab. I won't 